starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex, and uh, welcome to our February our March Dulem Tips and Tricks webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about twist workflow optimization. On the slide, we have a few notes about the GoToWebinar controls. There is a questions area in the GoToWebinar panel. If you have any questions, just uh, send them in there, and uh, I'll address them all at the end of the session. If anything particularly important to what I'm speaking about comes up, I may pause and uh, address a question then. So in general, what we're going to be talking about, if you've been using Twist for any long period of time, you've probably run into at least one workflow that's grown over the years, either, either due to changes in your own internal practice or due to changes in the Twist tool set. So we're going to really talk about how to optimize that and bring some of those old workflows up to speed. Three core things we're going to be talking about today, and the first is general workflow maintenance. Uh, some quick things you can do to get older workflows running well. Uh, we're going to talk about some common settings for tools that we've gotten a lot of questions about recently. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit more on then on workflow streamlining, showing you ways that you can reduce the amount of logic that you need to incorporate into your workflows so they are quicker and easier to maintain. And lastly, I'll show you a few troubleshooting tips. Uh, so you can basically build and collect data in your workflow, either for later analysis or for troubleshooting any issues that may arise. Before we begin, one more note, too. We do have Duo, uh, the Deleam User Conference, coming up in New Orleans early next month. Uh, going to be a lot of good information there. Great chance to get hands on with Deleam. Uh, that's going to be early April, as I mentioned. I think there's still a little bit of time left to get in on the uh, on the special hotel block that they reserved for this. Uh, there's a little more information on our site at the following links. So you can just take a look at those. It's going to be a great time. And uh, our webinar series, uh, this is one part of our webinar series. We run a Deleem webinar series. We have one webinar, the third Wednesday of each month. Uh, to see a full listing, you can go to our website at blanchardsystems.com slash events uh, and sign up for any future webinars we're going to be doing in the upcoming months. So. Without further ado, basically what we're going to be doing today is I built a workflow, and uh, this workflow uses some older logic in it. Uh, there's a few pieces of older logic that I've seen out there in the wild still. Uh, maybe not in this particular configuration, but we're going to go through this workflow and review it. And I'm going to show you some ways that you can update this to make it run more stably and more efficient. So as a first example, I don't know if you've ever cracked open a workflow file and taken a look inside. Uh, those DTW files, typically what they are is they're basically, they're somewhat human readable and they're basically an XML document that just has all the information for all the tools uh, in that workflow. So all the parameters are being written in there, uh, which generally is fine. One of the things if you have some workflows that perhaps started under Twist 4 in particular or Twist 5, uh, over time, some of those parameters tend to change. Uh, some older options which are deprecated might be removed from Twist. Uh, some newer options might be added. Typically, that discrepancy, if you have some older workflows, doesn't cause problems, but we've seen some cases where that can account for some strange behavior or impact performance a little. So if you're in a situation where you're doing a massive update, uh, it's generally good practice to replace. There's a few core tools. Uh, one of these, for example, is input files. There's been a lot of changes in input files in the past few years over how it handles dispatching files and uh, basically ingesting them. Two others, too. The two real big ones are PS Check and OPDF mainly because those two tools do a lot of the heavy lifting in a typical normalization workflow. Uh, there have been a lot of changes to those two over the past five, 10 years. So uh, sometimes you'll have a case where it's best to replace those uh, two. This typically isn't something you need to do every time you patch. It's not mandatory at all. But if you're in a situation where, for example, you're jumping a major version level, you're upgrading from twist six to twist seven, or you're jumping, maybe you haven't patched in two or three years and you're trying to get your system up to speed, that can be one way to make sure that your workflow is going to run as smoothly as possible. So for the sake of time here, I'm not going to replace these tools in my workflow right now. I do have one here as a, uh, it's another older workflow. 
And what this is going to do is, for example, this is a really old workflow. I think this is a Twist 5 workflow. And you'll see when I click on the PS check in this workflow, this is one good indicator for this sort of behavior. I get two warnings. The first tells me that the color management module has been replaced by a little CMS and the JDF 1.3 pre-flight engine is now used. Those are two signs the workflow is about seven or eight years old and you're not going to necessarily get the best performance out of that older tool. So in general, it's optional. If you see these two messages, that was one case where I would strongly recommend doing that. Uh, again, not gonna do that right now for time's sake. Uh, in general, there's a few settings in these tools too that we've gotten some questions about. So I'm gonna go through and take a look at those. Uh, in general, one of the ones that's cropped up a few times recently is this pre-flatten for ICC conversion tool in PS Check. And what that tool does is it deals with how files handle transparency and layers when doing color conversions. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer there, but what that tool is meant for is if you have a file that perhaps has, uh, maybe you have uh, two or three layers in there, you've got some transparency, and they're in a bunch of different color spaces. That's a recipe for color conversion problems. So what this does is that option takes a look, it crunches on the file and analyzes to see, it analyzes to see what in there might represent a color conversion issue uh, and pro proactively sort of flattens that. Uh, doesn't flatten the whole file or anything of that nature, but uh, it's typically a recommended setting and it can save you a lot of color grief in most cases where you've got a file that has multiple color spaces and transparency uh, or layered content. Uh, that said, there are two cases where I would keep an eye out for this option. In those two cases, the first is if you have, uh, this is more for on a per file basis, but if you've ever had a file that a customer submitted that maybe had a, a, a extremely large amount of vector content, such as, for example, like a repeating pattern in the background that winds, having, winds up having 10,000 or more little vector objects, then you can have that file wind up hanging and twist for a little bit just because it needs to go through and uh, check the interactions between all those options. That is one case where you can turn this off to see that the file process is a little better. Uh, there's no guarantee necessarily that will help, uh, but it is one thing you can try. The second case for this is we do have a few customers who had some issues with uh, the interaction between this option and a CT vector PDF. For example, if you're creating a digital edition, uh, there've been some cases where the flattening of this and then the flattening that the CT vector PDF option does too can cause some areas to get a little, little messy in that final PDF. So that's one other case where if you're trying to create a digital edition, you're getting an output that looks a little choppy. That is one thing you can tweak. The second thing in PS check that you do that you can tweak in that sort of situation is there's this create image as line work option. What this does is if you have a, an image that's just indexed colors, uh, a few indexed colors, what it'll try and do is it'll see if it can create that as a line work within your document. The idea being that it takes a little less space to save. Uh, the trade-off there is in some cases with certain images, uh, you can have some issues where it looks a little, it looks a little choppy in the PDF on screen. Uh, typically prints okay, but just looks a little funny on screen due to that uh, line work conversion. So if you run into that issue, one thing you can do here is change that from if possible, which I believe is the default setting, to only for one bit image. Moving over to PS check as well. A few different options in here. One, this isn't, isn't really an option that's misunderstood, but if you're using an older version of Twist, for example, uh, one great feature in the newer versions is this PDF CT vector option. What that's intended for is more like a screen PDF, such as the digital editions I was mentioning earlier. That option typically takes a document, it rasterizes and flattens everything, except the text. So you've got something that's gonna be a little more portable and look good on screen, but at the same time, is still text searchable. So one good option in there. Uh, another option too is this local rasterize option. And this deals with, again, transparency. Uh, it's a recurring theme in here. Uh, and a lot of older workflows I've seen a lot set to in CT, for example. And when it deals with that rasterize, it rasterizes those areas in CT. Uh, the in vector option is a little more, that's typically the recommended one for this now. And what that does is there's a little more logic in there that analyzes uh, 
what type of file it is and what type of content you're working with and it's able to preserve some of that rasterization in line work it's able to do some of it with vector clipping in some cases so it's another good option to keep in mind so two things there that you can do to make those tools run a little more smoothly now to look at this workflow as a whole, basically what this workflow is doing is it's taking a file and I actually misnamed one of my tools here, so let me fix that. Makes a little more sense. Not going to be running too many files through today. This is a little more based on theory. Uh, but what we're going to do is this workflow basically takes a file in, runs it through a PS check in some different settings depending whether it's post, script, or PDF outputs either a, a final high-res file, either an X1A or an X3, based on the hot folder it was uploaded to, and also creates a CT vector PDF for digital edition and transmits those to one of three print plant locations. So pretty straightforward workflow here. The way the logic is set up, I think I, let me get over to my uh, folder here. So the way this is set up is I have a few different hot folders in here. What these hot folders do is they're named for one of the three print plants, Chicago, New York, or LA, uh, an underscore, and then the name of the PDF output format. Uh, typically, that's a great way to handle a workflow like this. Uh, there's a few other cases where other dispatching methods might be a little more appropriate, which I can discuss later. But... <clears throat> In this case, there's a lot of outdated logic. I'm using a lot of filters in here, which uh, for the most part, there's a few filters which can be useful these days, such as uh, filter group for lining up a large number of files. But by and large, these filters here are just saying only allow PDFs down this path. Uh, these ones down here are only saying allow files that have a hot folder with X1A in the name down this path, which there's nothing wrong with that, but there are a little more efficient ways that you can handle that sort of situation. So what I would do in this case, actually, and the reason these are split up is another kind of old hat trick here is this is using a what's called a saved param file. If you've been using Twist for older versions, such as four or five, you're probably pretty familiar with these. Saved param files are down here in the bottom of most basic tools, you have the ability to save all the settings of those tools into a little file that you can then use to recall them later. Uh, pretty handy, but the one there are a few problems you can run into with that approach. Uh, the first is they're not very portable. There are some challenges, especially if you're using these param files within a workflow and using a set param from RE to turn those on. Uh, they're, they're an extra thing you'd have to migrate between servers. Uh, if you have multiples there and you want to change another setting, then you have to go through and make sure that your setting would be tweaked in all the param files you needed to make that change in, so a little more maintenance there. And lastly, uh, from an oversight perspective, it could be a little problematic if, for example, you delete this set param from RE here that's telling PS Check to use that param which in this case, there wouldn't really be too much of a warning in the workflow to save you from that sort of issue. So what we're gonna do here is instead, I'm gonna get rid of these. I'm actually gonna get rid of uh, yeah, these guys too. I'll save my uh, stash, cause uh, maybe I wanna keep a stash of just PostScript for some reason. What I'll do for this one is, under the link editor, if I double click on that link, I have the ability to set a programmatic link and I'll do so here. I'm gonna set the type to PostScript. And so what that's gonna do now is anytime a link comes through, a file comes through, if it's a PostScript file, it's gonna send, get sent down there and it's gonna stash a copy of that. I'm gonna take this, I'm actually gonna give this a nickname. PS check default. Now, the alternative option you have in here, as opposed to, and I'll actually save this as a new copy too, so I don't uh, lose my original. What you can do is, rather than having to maintain those param files, one other option is you can go into this tool programmatically and tweak any setting in here. So maybe, for example, if it's a PostScript file, I want to 
pre-flight it. If it's not a PostScript file, I don't want to pre-flight it. So what I would do here is I'm going to do two things. The first is I am going to take this. I'm going to actually add in here a so I can find it uh, file check tool just to grab some information about the file that's coming in. Always good to have, and I think it lets me do this a little more smoothly. Uh, but what I'll do is, if you click on this PS check and you go to expert editing, it shows you in here some different options for all the settings that are in that tool. Uh, they're not particularly human readable in here. There's some stuff in here you can see. Uh, how I tend to find if there's one setting I'm looking to tweak, uh, the one sheet I tend to use in this case, for example, is I'm just going to copy and paste this, and I have Text Wrangler open here get that window over here. I'm just going to copy and paste those in there for reference. Then I'm going to go in here again and I'm going to uh, set that to pre-flight and normalize. And now if I go back to expert editing, I'm going to copy and paste those into another text file. Uh, you can do this. There are a few command line tools you can use to compare files as well. I just have this handy right now. So I'm going to go and find differences. I'm going to take a look at those two untitled text files. And what it's going to do is it's going to tell me, okay, here's your one line that's different. In this case, that one line that's different is apply preflight. Uh, the value for that setting is set to true in my one and false in my other. So all I have to do to enable preflight in that PS check is I can go in here and say, So lost a window over here. One sec. I could say custom. I'll do document format matches PDF. Then PS check alias PS check default. Value apply preflight is set with true. So what this is going to do is, if a file comes in, the file check pulls out the uh, document type. If that document type is a PDF, then that's going to sneak into this PS check here, and it's going to enable the preflight option. Otherwise, if it's a PostScript file for right now, it's not going to touch that. So I like that the way that is. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here too is it's important to give a name to. I typically like to give a name to whatever tools I'm going to be overloading because uh, if you had this, for example, say just PS check, then what that would do is that would toggle for every PS check in the workflow. It would toggle that preflight setting, which might not be the case at some other PS check in your workflow or some other tool in your workflow. Uh, the alias allows you to single in on that specific tool. Uh, you do also have the ability to do that using every tool has a tool number in the workflow. It's basically the number order that that tool was dropped in. Uh, and you can do that, but there are some cases where, for example, if you remove a tool and paste it back in, that number can change and that can cause you some issues as well. So. I'm happy with the way that looks right now. It's going to warn me that won't work with older versions of Twist. I'm okay with that. We can do the same thing over here, for example, with these filter matches. So I'm going to take these. I'm actually going to get rid of one of these and uh, make this OPDF high res. We'll do the same kind of thing in here again. We'll have it set up so that if custom get mem variables plant location matches NYC. Actually matches, actually I'll do this with the hot folder again. Then 
and I actually have the value saved over here. So in this case, what this is going to do is, if that is an X3 file, if the HUF folder has X3 in the name, then it's going to set that uh, high res PDF output type to X3. I'll actually put one in here too as a default. So I don't want to use that one. Let me use. Would help if I saved my uh, thing here one second. Make one more copy of this. And if I wanted to, I could make it, I could check if that other hot folder was an X1A. Uh, the, the one benefit you do have to doing it this way as opposed to using those filters as I was earlier is you have the ability to set uh, a default setting, for example. So this way in my workflow, I have it come through and uh, if something doesn't get set right, maybe if I don't know what kind of PDF I want, I just want to play it safe and get an X1A. What this would do when it evaluates these rules, it would look through and it would hit the X1A first. It would set that OPDF to use the X1A, uh, but then if it saw an X3 in the HUF folder name, it would reset it to X3. So you, you, you have a little safeguard there. Save that again. One thing I will say as a general rule with this sort of thing is, with the OPD, with this kind of parameter overloading, what I typically recommend is this is it's a useful tool if you have a few settings you have to tweak. So maybe if there's three or four things in a PS check that you want to tweak, then that's a pretty good way to do it. Uh, typically for me, if I have something that's completely different, for example, I have my CT Vector Digital Edition PDF, I tend to like to keep those a little separate so that way it's, if it's intended for a different purpose, I keep it as a different tool just for man manageability purposes. You could set that up in there to override and just use one, but uh, then you can run into some uh, maintenance snags there. So this should be pretty clean the way it is. Now the last thing we're going to do in here just to clean up this ending, uh, this workflow has just hard-coded paths to three different facilities. So what we're going to do here is, and there's a benefit of this too, is you have the ability to keep track of that and easily keep track of, for example, if LA and New York have a different file system structure, you can incorporate that into here, some checks to make sure that they all get all files get transmitted to the correct place, but you only really need to use one transmit to do so. And how I like to do that typically is I'll just set up a rule in here that says if custom get mem LA I'll do is I'll make that symbol mount. Maybe there's a top of my file system here. And I'm just going to keep that the same for all three of these guys for right now. I'll make another variable location path. And I'll just set that equal to If 
you haven't played with the set param from RE too much in the past, uh, what's what the syntax is doing is the getmem variables, this is what's called a tickle command, and it's used to extract a value of some variable that I have saved in this workflow. So in this case, it's grabbing the value of the plant location variable, and I'm using that to check whether that matches a certain value, and then set a variable, another variable based off of that. So I'm going to set one more in here. So it looks good to me. So the benefit of something like this is if I go over to these transmits, I can actually get rid of most of this bulk in here. I'll just make this transmit. And set these back up here. And then all I need to do is set in here just uh, and what this would do is when a file reaches that uh, final transmit here what it's going to do is it's going to look at these values and basically build the transmit path on the fly uh, the benefit of that is maybe la decides they want a different file system structure uh, if i had a larger workflow that had maybe dozens of transmits in it and they were all hard coded then one of the problems you can run into is then okay la wants a different uh file system structure to go through and find all the transmits that use that and change them manually. This way you're building it on the fly. So all you have to do is change, for example, if maybe there's a root path at the top of the drive here, I just change that and I can toggle that one variable for just that one print location. So a little more flexibility over doing this with multiple hard coded values, a little more flexibility over doing this with, uh, for example, uh, Still, some people use there's a file it, which was a predecessor to the transmit tool. Uh, so this allows you a little more flexibility there. So it's a much cleaner workflow, but there's still a few more things we can do to clean this up. Uh, one option you have is, for example, if you had a larger workflow and you wanted to keep track of the different segments, uh, it doesn't make as much sense for something small like this. But one thing I like to do is create, for example, with the node tool, the node's just an empty tool. It's used more for layout purposes on a page. But I could have, for example, these little reminders that note what a section is. So this way, it's, it's a little redundant in this small of a workflow, but if you had a larger workflow and you had these sections, what you can do is effectively use those nodes as a little bit of a troubleshooting tool there to keep track of the sections of the workflow. So that way, if you decide that maybe you need to add a few more different tools in here before it gets to the digital edition, for example, uh, you have this kind of its own little modular area here. So. Uh, that's one way you can keep track of what that specific section of a workflow is doing. It also makes it a little easier for grouping. If I decide I need to move a chunk of this workflow down to another workflow entirely, or I need to tweak that a little, uh, and I have I, ha I have that all segmented a little nicer. Uh, the one thing I've seen some people do with that too, which I've taken to recently, is you can just pop one in the corner as a form of version control. Uh, if you've been using Twist, you, you may run into a situation where maybe you make a change in a workflow you didn't intend to. Uh, you can use it and then you have to roll back and figure out which copy uh, you had on your local machine was the newest copy. You could do something like just put a note in there and say like, uh, wrong window there. Last updated. So that way it's sort of like a comment in there. You have a little more version controllability. So those are a few things you can do to get your workflow itself running a little more smoothly. Uh, in some cases, if you'd wanted to, for example, with the hot folder, uh, you could have, one other option you had is if you had another customer, for example, I think the hot folder setup we had for this works pretty well in this case, but maybe you had another case where you had another customer that uploaded files to this workflow, but they used uh, 
an FTP or they needed a little more pre-processing to get the files ready given the files they were uploaded. So what you could do in that case too is you could use more hot folders like that. You do also have the ability, this is one of those things I would say use sparingly, but it is an option. Uh, you do have the ability to add multiple input files tools and uh, basically specify multiple inputs. So for example, if I were in a case where, let me see what I could do here. Maybe, maybe someone needed their files renamed and they were coming in from an FTP. I could set the second input files up with the FTP config for that server, have that run to a few different tools before it gets into the workflow. That's another option you have to help rein in if you if you, if there's a few more things you need to do in there, uh, you do have the ability to do that. Uh, the one drawback to this sort of approach, though, is each of those does take up research resources to monitor the file system for any new files that are being uploaded. Uh, so that's one thing. It's used sparingly if you need it, but uh, that's one thing I would watch out for. I'm going to get rid of that for right now. It doesn't really pertain to my particular workflow here. So. We're running a little short on time. I'm going to try and wrap this up reasonably quickly, but I do have one, one or two more things that uh, I do want to show you before uh, we head off. So the next thing would be for troubleshooting. There's a few different tactics you can use here. Uh, if you haven't played with any real troubleshooting in Twist before, the easiest way to really troubleshoot something is to stick... Uh, like maybe you, maybe you made a change and you're trying to figure out why something's not working. What I tend to like to do in that case is just put in a show memories and a validate. This is kind of troubleshooting 101 here, but uh, what those two tools will do together is the show memory shows you all the variables that have been set in twist and the validate allows you to basically check those and make sure you're getting the values that you wanted. So I'm just going to stick these in here real quick. And in this case, what I'll do is just take this and drop in a file here. I think I have some files lying around on my desktop. What would happen in this case is it goes through, it goes through the file check, it hits the show memories. What that show memories will do is it'll show me all the variables that have been set in that dot in that are associated with this document in twist right now. So I can see, for example, at a specific point in time, my file format was PDF. I can see that I had some uh, information on embedded fonts in here. So I can use that if I want to troubleshoot. I can stick a few of those in different places. Uh, where that can get interesting is, for example, you could use a set prem from RE like this, stick a few of these into a portion of your workflow, into different portions of your workflow, and have it set to determine if it's running in production or on development. Maybe, for example, if you, have, if you have a separate server that you like to test workflows on, you could say, if it's running on this server, then go down this path and let me check this, pause, and make sure the output's correct. Uh, you could do that same sort of thing for uh, example, with the, even with the workflow names. If you had one copy that was page upload production, you had a second copy that was page upload uh, development, you could configure that in here based on the workflow name so that if you run it in production, it just zooms through. If you run it in test, it pauses and allows you to step through and see what's happening at each point in the workflow. If you want to get a little more trickier than that, what you can do is, let me actually get rid of these again. Uh, one other option that's newer, I think it came out in Twist 6, so it's been there for a while, but uh, the error node is another option you have to use as a form of error handling. If you run into a situation where, oh, I don't think that quite made it, there we go. So what that can do is, if you hit a point in the workflow where nothing's where something blows up the error node will allow you to sort of recover and run with it uh, so for example in, in a simple case what you could do is you could configure this so that it uh, for example email someone I just stick a send mail in there usually I'd wind up sticking a show memory so I can see what the error was about uh, but one other thing you could do if you want to get a little trickier here is I'm gonna stick a validate in here and uh, I'll nickname that error. What I'm also going to put in here is 
I'm going to do a little magic trick with a set param from RE here. This is one thing I'm partial to doing in cases of errors. So I'm going to rig this up. Name this one uh, right to CSV. And I'm going to copy this one in to make sure I type it correctly. Uh, but basically what it is, is I have a little string here. And what this string is going to do is I just paste this into the set param from RE. And this is going to run a Linux terminal command from within twist. That terminal command is going to take a bunch of values from my workflow. And it's going to write them into a little primitive spreadsheet called the CSV. So that way, if a file fails, I can check a few of those values later on, have a record that it failed, and be able to determine if there are any trends that uh, are happening. Maybe only X1As are failing for some reason, or only files with RGB content are failing. So what I'll do here is I'm just going to set this a file name matches that. I'm just going to copy and paste this in here. So what we can do now is, for example, let me break this workflow intentionally. I'm going to stick a thing before my PS check in here that says uh, if type is, let's go with a, a stuff at archive sounds good. So if I drop a PDF in here, it's not going to have anywhere to go, and it's going to error out of twist. So if I go back to my hot folder here, I think I had a, there we go. I'll make a, and I'm going to drop this in here. So we can see now this file came in. There were a few things that it couldn't find a location to go to. So it jumped rather than just erroring out here between the set param and PS check. It erred out down here at uh, the, it erred out here at the error node. It went through and it performed this uh, command here and then it's pausing and validate. So I have some visual cue in editor that something's wrong. Let me actually stick a few more of those in here for fun. And what will happen is, out of my uh, file system here, a little log file here, and actually they all ran through them, so I'm going to reopen that real quick. So, for example, here you can see some of these it just wrote into a little mini spreadsheet here. I have my file name, I have my PDF version, I have the date that it errored out, the server errored out, and if it could find it, uh, the print location it was intended to go to. So that way I could have that out on a file system somewhere. If something blows up, I have a record of it. Uh, this sort of thing is, and that's all done by that little uh, set param from RE here that's just echoing a bunch of that into a file. Uh, but that's very handy if I want to go back and determine why certain things are failing or have a record of what errored in a workflow. That sort of thing can also be very useful for general file tracking. For example, uh, if you use that in conjunction with a filter timer tool, uh, then you could use that to keep track of how long it takes certain files to run through a workflow. And uh, if you use those, and rather than just like a CSV, for example, here, you could even push up to a database, uh, upload all that information to a database, and run reporting based off your workflow. So you could see, OK, New York had this many files uploaded this week. New York had this many errors, this many, this percentage of their files errored out. Uh, and you could use that to analyze and tweak your workflow a little more as necessary. I uh, wanted to include a little more of that today. Didn't have enough time. Uh, that may wind up being a future webinar. Uh, but uh, there's a few different things you can do there to help clean up your workflows, uh, reduce the amount of tools you need, uh, pick optimal settings, and uh, essentially just uh, 
make these things report a little more about what they're doing. So hopefully that helped. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Seeing, I think there's two questions I'm seeing here. The first one is, are there any cases you would you would want to use a uh, filter? And you know, there's a few cases where filters, in the most part, they're kind of uh, they're they're still they're not obsolete, but there's usually more efficient ways to perform certain actions in Twist Seven. Uh, there are some cases where, for example, if you had a the two common ones I use a lot are filter timer and uh, yeah filter timer and uh, the other one filter group. Filter timer basically just lets you keep track of, for example, uh, how long a file is taking to go through a certain per portion of a workflow. You would just set up two of these with a name, uh, like for example, this one's called trap. You have one that starts it one that stops the timer, and then you can use that time and keep track of that. Uh, the other one that's still used a lot is the filter group. And the filter group, what that does is, I think I got one here. What the filter group does is that can be used if you have a bunch of single pages that you wanted to combine into a multi-page or something where you needed all those files sort of lined up. Uh, the filter group allows you to do that. Uh, so there are still some uses for them, uh, but, uh, in most cases, it's uh, you can accomplish what they what they were built for a little quicker using other methods. Uh, for example, another another example of that is, for example, like a filter TIF. Uh, some of these options you could use to filter. Maybe you only wanted CMYK TIFFs coming in. Typically, the recommended way to do that sort of thing now would be to use a file check and uh, just go in there and pull out the information about that TIFF and either set that up in programmatic links or set that up in a set param to evaluate those settings. Uh, but yep, that's about the gist of that. One comment I will make more on that too regarding save parameter files. Uh, those typically aren't, uh, those aren't the recommended way to do most actions anymore. But the case where you'd want to use these save params a lot of times is, for example, if you have a tool that's very configuration heavy. The best example I can think of is like a merge XP where there's just a lot of different options that need to be configured each time. There's merit to them for that cases, but again, it's one of those things where in 90% in of the cases, there's a more efficient way to uh, utilize the twist tool set. Uh, not seeing any more questions in here. So uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, if you have any suggestions for a future webinar, just drop us a line. If you have any more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me after this webinar as well. So thank you very much and have a good day.